Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General. Today's program is part of our Climate Change and Health Series, a special collaboration among the Blum Center, the MGH Center for the Environment and Health, and the MGH Institute of Health Professions Center for Climate Change, Climate Justice and Health. Before I get started, I just want to go over a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that you are in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so we can hear our guest speakers today. If you have any questions for our speakers, you may use the chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time from the end. Only Blum Center staff and our guest speakers will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat. If you have a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. Lastly, at the end of today's session, you'll be directed to a brief survey, which we'd like to ask you to help us complete. Your feedback is important to us as we plan future programs. All right, so next, I would like to introduce you all to today's guest speakers. Joining us today, we have Dr. Sue Ellen Brakey. Dr. Brakey is Distinguished Teaching Associate Professor in the School of Nursing and Associate Director of the Center for Climate Change, Climate Justice and Health at the MGH Institute of Health Professions in Charlestown. Her clinical background includes global health and clinical critical care nursing. Dr. Brakey teaches in the Doctor of Nursing Practice in Acceler BSN programs with a focus on ethics, evidence-based practice in population health. Joining us today, we also have Dr. Patrice Nicholas. Dr. Nicholas is Distinguished Teaching Professor and Director of the MGH Institute of Health Professions Center for Climate Change, Climate Justice and Health, and Co-Director for Policy and Advocacy of the MGH Center for the Environment and Health. She teaches in the Doctor of Nursing Practice Program and advises Accelerate Bachelor of Science in Nursing students at the MGH Institute. She also serves at the MGH Center for the Environment and Health on behalf of the Department of Nursing and Patient Care Services. They join us today to give a talk on populations at higher risk for health consequences of climate change. But before I turn it over to Dr. Brakey, Dr. Patrice has a few words she'd like to share with you all. Thank you, Amy. I'm delighted to say how excited we are to be offering this climate change and health series. It's been a very important contribution on behalf of the MGH Institute Center for Climate Change, Climate Justice, and Health, the MGH Center for the Environment and Health, and importantly, the Blum Fam Patient and Family Learning Center. So thank you on behalf of Dr. Brakey and myself. Thanks, Patrice. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. And... Um, as Amy and Patrice mentioned, we're going to talk today a little bit about populations um, at higher risk for health consequences of climate change. And this list is probably not exhaustive. And you might even note that there's some repetition as we talk about what some of the risks are. And I think as we um, talk a little further, you'll kind of understand um, you'll understand that. So just as background in terms of climate change and its impact on health, it has been identified as one of the greatest global public health challenges of the 21st century. And it really is a global problem. Um, today, we're going to talk about health impacts primarily on um, people in the United States, which could then probably translate to people in um, resource rich countries, but it's important to note that this is something that um, we need to tackle as a global community. Um, and so the picture on the left here is just showing how um, greenhouse gases warm the atmosphere and that they, you know, the sunlight emits um, warmth into the atmosphere and then down into the earth um, where it is absorbed by um, the oceans and the trees and the, the atmosphere in general. 
and then bounces back up into the the atmosphere um, where it where warming is facilitated by greenhouse gases. And so we need greenhouse gases to keep the earth warm. But what, as we all probably know, has happened over the last um, hundred years or so, even greater, has been that there has been an, an increase, a disproportionate amount of greenhouse gases. And so that's what's contributing to the warming. And the picture on the right shows, you know, really over a very long period of time, um, centuries and centuries, hundreds of centuries, how the atmospheric carbon dioxide has stayed relatively stable. And you see fluctuations in terms of, you know, natural variation and fluctuations, but you can see right around um, the industrial period where there was an increase in electricity and transportation, you can see that real exponential um, vertical rise in greenhouse gas emissions. And so that kind of baseline number has been somewhere around 300. And as of the NASA website today, we're up to 419 parts per million. So typically it's been steady at 300 parts per million or less. And now we you can see that we have um, exceeded that kind of baseline pretty significantly. In terms of global greenhouse gas emissions, this, um, this is a busy slide, but it shows you um, who the top emitters are. Um, looking at EU as a country here, so China, the United States, the EU, India, Russia, and so on. And you can also see this orange piece of the pie shows you that the top 10 emitters really contribute to what's that, maybe about two thirds or so of the total emissions. Um, and so this really is, um, depicts kind of like the issue of climate injustice that we know that the top emitters probably have more resources for the most part and in infrastructure to develop resilience. And then these other countries, uh, many of them are, um, more have less resources to kind of address the impacts of climate change. And then in the United States, these these figures are from 2020. But um, again, this is probably something people are familiar with, but as a review, carbon dioxide is the number one greenhouse gas emission, um, followed by methane, which often comes from you know agricultural farming nitrous oxide and fluorinated gases. And so while carbon dioxide is the top emitter, um, it's important to note that methane, nitrous oxide and fluorinated gases are, um, they're, they're strong emitters. So they actually last in the atmosphere for a longer period of time. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, their contribution to, to global warming is significant. And then again, uh, to the to the right, you can see um, the top greenhouse gas emissions or total by sector. So transportation, electricity, industry, commercial, residential, and agriculture. Um, again, probably a review because since you know 2016, when this was developed by. Um, um, the climate change and human health was put out by globalchange.gov here. Um, people are, I think, are more familiar with the climate impacts and the trends. In the Northeast, where we are, <clears throat> we're seeing more extreme precipitation. We're also seeing more flooding, more heat, um, sea level rise to the south of us is in addition to heat. Um, and to the west, we know um, and, and the Pacific Northwest and the West, we're seeing wildfires, heat waves, and drought. And then these are all contributing to health outcomes as well. Um, this is a nice infographic by the CDC, which just points out some of the ways in which these climate impacts impact health. So more extreme weather, more air pollution, 
um, changes in a vector ecology. We're seeing asthma, cardiovascular disease, um, vector-borne illness is increasing. Um, again, in the Northeast, we see a lot of Lyme disease, which is actually getting more concentrated and then expanding to the West and the North. Um, that's just one example. Increasing allergens, we're seeing um, asthma and respiratory allergies, water quality impacts from rising sea levels. We're seeing more um, waterborne illnesses, food and supply impacts um, are leading to malnutrition and diarrheal disease and malnutrition and undernutrition coupled with obesity is really a significant issue that will impact health in the future when food, you know, certain areas are unable to sustain their own food growth. Um, environmental degradation is leading to forced migration, civil conflict, mental health impacts, um, and extreme heat is increasing heat-related illness and death and cardiovascular failure, and, and, as well as um, uh, neurological impacts such as increased stroke. So the ways that um, climate change impacts can be addressed are through three strategies. The first is mitigation, which is reducing and stabilizing the levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, and so we know a lot of things, that we, we talk a lot about that, you know, in terms of um, clean energy, et cetera. Adaptation, which is reducing our vulnerability to the existing impacts of climate change and also making the most of inevitable changes. So if you're in an area that has increased growing seasons, then you're, you know, it will be important to take advantage of that to grow more um, food, even though it should be noted that because of the increased um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's actually getting into um, crops and making them changing the, their micronutrient makeup and making them less nutritious um, in a way that we wouldn't even be aware of. So that's not an example of food insecurity, but more changes in the nutritional value of food. And then resilience, the ability to pre prepare and plan for, recover from, and more successfully adapt to adverse events. And so thinking about resilience, we think about it at the individual level and the community level as well. So people and communities differ in their exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity to respond to the impacts of climate change. And this um, infographic just kind of shows you how one's, you know, ability to one's exposure, you know, when people are exposed to stressors or impacts of climate change, um, as individuals and as communities, their sensitivity and their ability to adapt all influence their vulnerability to health impacts of climate change. So if you have, if you live in an area where there's poor infrastructure, um, then that's going to impact the way, let's say, your community is able to respond or um, deal with um, or or the, how they're going to be able to respond to, let's say, extreme weather events, hurricane and flooding. Um, likewise, if you live in a area where um, there's, you know, you live in an urban heat island, which is a place that is, you know, susceptible to higher heat days, both in the daytime and the nighttime, um, and you don't have access to cooling spaces or trees or green space or cooling centers or air conditioning, then you're going to be more vulnerable. And then these all then impact um, your health and the health of populations and communities. So again, I this may not be I I'm this may not be an exhaustive list, but when we think about who are the groups or populations that are at risk for um, more negative impacts on health related to climate change and actually on the health on the on the impacts themselves, we think about older adults, children and infants, pregnant people, 
people living with chronic physical or mental, mental conditions, <clears throat> people living with disability, which is probably maybe one of the more understudied areas in this, in this regard, um, indigenous communities, certain communities of color, those with low socioeconomic status and non-US citizens. And so again, within these groups of people, there are variations in terms of their risk, depending on um, the resources they have available to them to adapt, to create resiliency, and to be able to respond to climate threats. And this um, just kind of points out the different the different factors that are involved in someone's risk. So um, to the left here, we see environmental, <clears throat> excuse me, an institutional context. So land use change, ecosystem change, infrastructure condition, geography, where you live, um, agricultural production and livestock use. And we also see that there's a social and behavioral component as well. So age and gender, race and ethnicity, poverty, housing and infrastructure, education, discrimination, access to care, um, a community health infrastructure, pre-existing health conditions. And so here we're really talking about the social determinants that impact health and, and specifically how they relate to climate change. And then the exposure pathways include heat, poor air quality, reduced food and water, changes in infectious agents, and population displacement. And these all lead to heat-related illness, cardiopulmonary illness, food, water, and vector-borne disease, mental health consequences and stress. And I would also add here um, pregnancy outcomes as well. So older adults, again, not all older adults, but some older adults, um, 65 years and older, um, are at risk for <clears throat> health impacts of climate change. And these, um, these relate to their level of social isolation, um, their level of, of mobility, physiologic changes within the human body as we age and their ability to respond, like so for instance, to heat. Um, in the last 20 years, the number of people who have died from heat-related illness has doubled. Um, and heat-related illness, by the way, should be preventable um, with given the right education, awareness, and resources. Um, and medications. And so all of these things put people at risk. So if there is a um, natural disaster, are they able to, do they have the resources to leave the environment? If it's heat, do they have the ability to um, cool themselves? Do they live in an area where there is no access to cooling centers or they have low socioeconomic status so they can't um, put strategies in place to increase their individual resilience. And social isolation is a really important um, factor for older adults. Those who have more social capital do better generally, um, regardless of climate change in other situations as well. Children are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change for several reasons their dependence on other people, um, their, their physiology, along with their cognitive development. So um, for instance, kids who, let's say, have to be uprooted from their home because of a natural disaster or fire, um, and perhaps they have interruptions in education, but these things all contribute to um, decreases in their, or impacts on their cognitive development which may or may not be evident initially, but so those are some long-term impacts that occur. Um, interruptions in family units. So, you know, there's a disaster and um, kids are, you know, sent to live with family members in other parts of the country. So this is, as you can see, there would be some just, you know, some disruptions from a psychosocial standpoint. 
Um, and then also just anxiety related to the state of the planet. So there has been a lot of research looking at um, kids and young adults and their perceptions about what's happening right now to the planet. And they're very distressed. Um, they have eco-anxiety and eco-grief, which are specifically related to um, stress related to the degra degradation of the planet. Um, they're angry. They feel that adults are not doing enough. And they also feel helpless sometimes because they, um, they're they not in a place, you know, they're not a voting age, so they're not at a place to make any changes. So big mental health impacts, but there are also physical impacts, especially for kids under the age of five. So they're more susceptible to um, heat-related illness, for children who live near um, areas where there's a lot of air pollution, perhaps an urban heat island, so higher, hotter days in the summer and the combination of those things, they experience more asthma, um, perhaps more allergies. So kids have both, you know, physical, um, well, all of these groups have both physical and mental health risks. Um, pregnant people, um, heat, and air pollution specifically can impact birth outcomes and um, lead to some congenital abnormalities, preterm labor, intrauterine growth restriction. And this is particularly um, important or significant for those people who live in environment, environmental justice communities or areas um, where that have been historically redlined in the past or um, where there, there are areas of disinvestment. And what's important to note is that these impacts from historic redlining and subsequent disinvestment um, impact maternal uh, pregnancy outcomes today. And so impacts on both mothers and babies. So that what, what stopped you know, in the 60s is still impacting people today. And the outcomes are worse um, in Black and Hispanic persons. People living with chronic physical or mental conditions um, have, you know, things to consider for these groups of people are, you know, are there interruptions in their access to care? So again, this is where the interlap starts to come in. There are a lot of people who have maybe minimal risk to the health impacts of climate change, but if you couple that with um, social determinants of health, their access to care, the their built environment, their infrastructure, their uh, the ability of their communities in which they live to adapt to climate change, these things all can um, contribute to health outcomes. And there are also medication considerations as well as mobility considerations. You know, lots of medications. First of all, you want to think about access in terms of if we have a natural disaster, a hurricane or flood, um, which interrupts, you know, which has a significant impact on infrastructure um, and people aren't able to get their medications. That puts them at risk, um, as does... Um, Oh, I just lost my train of thought on that. But the other thing I would say is that um, people who are living with chronic physical and mental can, can have a more acute exacerbations of their conditions. So for instance, um, there, there's, a, um, there's a correlation between um, heat and violence so uh, in which there are more emergency visits for violence re violence during heat waves. Um, so thinking about how can you not only make sure that people get the care they need for during climate conditions, climate related conditions, but also thinking about what are they at risk for in terms of um, like having exacerbations of their existing illness, whether it be mental conditions, mental health conditions, or physical conditions like cardiovascular disease, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, et cetera. 
And as I mentioned, work around people living with disability has been less well studied, um, but there are issues to consider. And again, a lack of access, um, thinking about will people living with disability have access to the care they need during um, climate events, um, an underlying maybe unconscious discrimination or bias. And so one example of this, which is related but not completely, um, is around the time when, when COVID hit and states were putting together, including Massachusetts, their um, crisis standards of care, bringing together um, experts to determine how will care be delivered in the face of a lack of resources. And so lots of really smart people put these crisis standards of care together in Massachusetts. And there were several um, communities, including the disability community, who came together and said, you know, you are not actually considering us in these crisis standards of care because they live with, um, so for instance, people with certain medical conditions um, may have been, um, when they were considering who would get the, the, the resources that were um, not available to everyone, the limited resources, there was some writing in there that unconsciously um, made disabled people, people with, with disabilities, not eligible for certain levels of care. And so they really came together um, and those crisis standards of care were, were revised. And if you think about that, you know, we're sure to have more natural disasters, more infection, emerging infectious disease. And so it's really important to make sure that all voices are involved in these, you know, really important decisions that need to be made. Um, the level of support that they need, whether that people with um, living with disabilities need physical support, you know, supports to do their activities of day daily living or medical support um, that may, you know, rely on people or machines or electricity. Um, this is important to consider how this will impact their health. Um, consideration and planning, um, as I mentioned, and also accessibility and emergency messaging. So are the public service announcements and messages that are getting out there around um, emergency preparedness and ongoing communication during climate events, are those accessible to people who have um, sensory deficits, whether it be, you know, lack of visual, lack of vision, hearing, um, et cetera. And then I just have a note here that um, just in terms of the, the impact this has on people, in 2019, there were more than 41 million US adults living with a disability. And I italicized adults because um, that doesn't include children who might be living with a disability who would also be impacted. Indigenous communities, and so um, they they have um, they also have risks for probably higher risk for health Im impacts, and um, including food insecurity from melting sea ice, um, changes to their culture, and so as sea ice melts, um, people are going to have to think about, they're going to have to shift the way they think about nutrition. Um, there can be economic impacts as people go from more of a um, finding and acquiring their own food to having to go to stores and get store-bought food. Um, and this is, I just, this picture is, um, and Patrice actually pulled this out of this um constellation, but uh, this was a, a um, art gallery, the, the art gallery is the, con the current center for contemporary art, which is located in Stowe, Vermont. And Patrice and I were invited to speak to the group specifically around mental health impacts um, related to climate change. And this was just one picture, but the, the 
the art exhibit was called When the Well is Dry. And this is this particular picture, which I think is really compelling, is from um, a photographer named Acacia Johnson. Um, and it's titled Charlotte Collecting Water. Um, and it was published in the National Geographic. But what's also really important about indigenous communities in particular is to think about the mental health impacts that they have the potential to experience because of the loss of their land and their connection to the land. And so one particular mental health diagnosis um, or impact, I should say, is called solastalgia, which is kind of a desolate feel, a feeling of desolation because of the loss that someone has in relation to their land and their environment. And so that's very um, significant for indigenous communities. And then certain communities of color, and again, th these, these impacts and risks are not distributed evenly. They, de they depend on region, they depend on um, community, they depend on where you live in, in the city. Um, so they, they change. And this is from um, a scoping review, which was published in 2022, um, that was very comprehensive, took a look at um, racial disparities related to climate change impacts. And in most cases, Black, Latinx, Native American, Pacific Islander, and Asian communities are at higher risk of climate related health impacts than whites, but not in all cases. And that's important to note, but in many, many cases. And um, in adults, this results in higher mortality, um, higher levels of respiratory and cardiovascular disease, um, disparities in mental health, and also heat related illness. So I just wanted to share a few examples from this paper with you to kind of, um, and, and there, there are many, and again, many different regions are addressed, but in terms of heat, um, one study from their scoping review showed that 84% of Latinx farm workers in Florida experienced at least one heat related illness symptom and 40% experienced three or more um, in terms of hurricanes, there was a higher likelihood for Blacks with PTSD one to two years after Hurricane Katrina to have a cardiovascular event um, than those who did not have PTSD. And then among whites, there was no association. There was no difference. And then in terms of wildfires, there's a higher odds of asthma and heart-related emergency department visits among Alaska Natives than non-Alaska Natives associated with PM 2.5 exposure from wildfires. And PM 2.5 is particulate matter 2.5. And so that means um, particles that are 2.5 microns or smaller. So very, 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 very small particles. And What's, what's happening here is that without proper protection, people breathe this, these, uh, this particular matter into their lungs, which because it's so small, we don't necessarily have a protective mechanism against. So it gets deep into the lung tissue and causes um, inflammation and damage, you know, deep at the cellular level, which results in asthma and heart failure related ED visits. So people most likely without protection from that PM 2.5 exposure. Those with lower socioeconomic status, um, again, people who may live in disinvested or uh, and or historically redlined communities, um, can this most likely will lead to a lack of solid infrastructure, a lack of green space, a lack of tree cover. Um, and again, oftentimes these are people who live in urban heat islands. These are often um, environmental justice communities. So there's an increase in air pollution um, and uh, to, taken together all these things impact heat, uh, excuse me, health. And I just wanted to point out 
this is a study that was published, it's, it's a bit old now, it was published in 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And um, it was a, this group of scientists went out to um, Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, where at the time the mortality rate was being that was being communicated um, via the media was very low, like maybe 60 people, very, very low. And this group of researchers went out and they kind of went out into rural, very, very, very rural areas. They interviewed families. They looked at um, what was the number of people who had left, how many people had died, um, and what, what were the issues are around this. And what they found was that, you know, they ex extrapolated that the number of deaths was 4,645 excess deaths. And so it wasn't just from perhaps um, the initial contact of the hurricane, but it was really about delayed or interrupted care. Um, and as I mentioned, hurricane related migration was substantial, but the people, you know, had ac didn't have access to, let's say their dialysis, or they didn't have access to medications that they needed. So that number was much, much higher when you kind of zoom out and think about those social determinants and how they impact health and not just the immediate impacts of Hurricane Maria. And then um, non-US citizens, um, there may be a lack of access or a reluctance to utilize resources. And I just wanted to mention, um, you know, we just had the, um, what do you call it? The World Cup in Qatar just occurred or is occurring, I think. I'm not, I'm not a soccer fan, but I think it's still occurring. But one of the things that's really important to note about that particular event, um, obviously widely publicized and watched, is that thousands of people died of heat-related illness and bad working conditions um, in the process of putting together the, the buildings and the um, facilities that were required to house the World Cup. And many of those people were immigrants who came in um, from Nepal, India, and Bangladesh. And so looking at that, clearly that's looking at an international um, look at migrant health. Um, but this article that I'm quoting here, um, they looked at heat exposure and they found that heat-related deaths occurred for 2.23 or 999% of the deaths among non-US citizens compared to 0.2% of US citizens. Higher in Hispa Hispanic non-US um, uh, people in ages 18 to 24. And you know the authors of this article kind of questioned, they didn't have a good handle on what the differences were here um, or what the factors were that were contributing, but thought about differences in health, lifestyle, occupation, so perhaps more occupational health, uh, occupational workers who are working outside, um, farm workers, culture, and then migration biases. And, and one thing that um, is pretty well established is, you know, OSHA has protections for people who work outside and, um, those aren't being realized across the board. And so probably the people who are experiencing lack of protections from heat are um, migrants and non-US citizens. And then this is just an example, a local example from where we are located in Charlestown, which is also right next to Chelsea, which kind of looks at the impact of racial disparities, low socioeconomic status, and to a certain extent, non-US citizens and um, how in our area, this is kind of an exemplar of how health is being impacted. So if you look in Charlestown, it's a very small um, uh, neighborhood of Boston. It has a very affluent, um, very affluent constituents. And then it's also home to the largest housing development in the region. Um, 
And Chelsea is also a very small city um, and home to um, people, uh, highest, the highest rate of, the highest population in Chelsea is Hispanic population. Um, and they do also have a lot of non-US citizens. And you can see here, that's the Tobin Bridge, which actually spans both around the Bunker Hill housing development, actually where we teach at the Institute of Health Professions um, and in Chelsea. And so I think it's something like 80,000 cars go over the Tobin Bridge every day. So that's a lot of air pollution. And then areas like Bunker Hill housing development um, and areas in Chelsea could be considered an urban heat island. And so they then have those health impacts related to that. Um, but Chelsea is also, so these are also, you could consider parts of Charlestown and Chelsea environmental justice communities. Um, the Chelsea Creek is a major port through which the home heating oil and um, gas and fuel um, are delivered for the, the region. And on the pick of these, these are showing these big tanks where um, these are stored, but that's kind of leading to environmental degradation of the creek. It's also, you know, between these tankers, um, there's road salt that supplies the, the region. Um, these all lead to poor health outcomes. So like asthma, um, especially among kids, I think Chelsea has like the third highest emergency room rate for asthma, I think in the state, and they're a very, very small city. And then this just kind of shows you, um, so Chelsea's small, you can see, this is a this is looking at demographics. And so Hispanic is in yellow. So most of um, Chelsea is Hispanic, as I mentioned. And then this area um, down at the bottom left, if you look at where the Boston Auto Port is, in this area where the Bunker, Bunker Hill development is, you can see that there's a large Asian community and also um, that's where most of the black community is situated. And so this, this kind of shows you um, how these disparities can contribute to health outcomes. And then you think about not only these environmental issues, but air pollution from the Tobin Bridge and then the urban heat island effect can really impact health. Um, it, outdoor workers, so people who work in agriculture, public safety, construction, um, the military, all need to be thinking about um, protections in terms, especially with high heat days. And I also added here outdoor athletes. So thinking about like kids who might be playing, you know, practicing football or soccer or whatever sport they play outdoors during these high heat days, you want to think about that so people can minimize their protection. This is a picture of one of the workers who was um, doing construction for the World Cup in Qatar. And you can see, so I think they are 1.5 degrees Celsius above what they were um, 10 years ago. I forget the exact number. Uh, the exact time frame, but so it's really hot there. And look at you know what this, this gentleman has on. He has on a lot of clothes. He is on face covering. He is on a helmet. And so there's been a real, as I mentioned, a real increase in um, um, health impacts, mortality, but also um, chronic renal disease, often requiring dialysis because of the impacts of the heat, coupled with lack of adequate hydration and lack of um, rest breaks from the heat as well. So what can you do to mitigate your risk? If you, if you are in one of these, um, you feel like you might be potentially in one of these categories, you know, be aware of what your risks are um, and what you can do to lessen climate related health risks. Um, and there are lots of good websites out there. The CDC is one that talks a lot about, um, you know, asthma, allergies, heat. Um, if you have chronic illness, you know, what you really want to do is talk to your healthcare providers. Um, 
around how you can protect your health from especially around climate related um, impacts and especially those that are preventable like heat for instance um, talk about your medications understand the um, signs and symptoms of dehydration etc know your risk around that have an adequate supply of medications on hand so that if there is a climate event that you know shuts down um, um, drug stores, grocery stores, et cetera, make sure you have an adequate supply of medications, food and water on hand. And then engage in your community to understand what, what is being done in your community to mitigate risk and build resilience. Um, and learn more about resources that are in your community, whether they be cooling centers, um, particular resources for older people, um, ways to increase your social capital. Um, there's lots of things to do, but I think the first thing to do is understand like, wow, am I in one of these risk categories? And then once you know that, then you can take steps to work with your healthcare providers in your community to um, try to try to lessen those. So that's the end of the presentation, if people have questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. Thank you so much, Sue Ellen. If Patrice wants to add anything. It was wonderful. I, I added a lot of links and they're very powerful. So thank you. Oh, thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We are now towards the end of the session. So if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat. We have a question regarding colder months. Now that it's getting colder, are there any concerns we should start thinking about and how we can better prepare for them? Yeah, so generally um, we do see issues around cold. You know, was it last year? I, I lose time because of the pandemic, but you know, where in Texas they had that awful ice storm and that really impacted people, it impacted the grid. Mm -hmm. Um I think I think the same things apply. Um we usually get more fear like more warning around snow and blizzards, but I think just to be prepared um with your medications, with your food, with your water. If you, um, again, know where they're, know how to find out where the resources are in your community, whether, it, you know, if you have to leave your home, where can you go? What shelters are available? Um, you know, kind of just be aware of your environment and the messaging and what, what, the messaging is out there around what people should do. I think, I think we are getting better, like through the news, um, about telling people how to prepare, and it's a matter of kind of doing that. Mm -hmm. And so, Ellen, you touched upon the military. the The entire presentation was wonderful. The um, I have a nephew who was actually in Texas during that cold spell. And he said young, healthy people were extraordinarily vulnerable and became very ill. So even though cold is not as much what we think about with climate change, it is a challenge. And then you also touched upon the military and heat stress for workers, um, including military personnel is incredibly challenging. They they prepare in heat. Um, you touched upon the workers in Qatar, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly either, but the loss of life there was profound. And agricultural workers in the United States are incredibly vulnerable, as are construction workers and others. And even during the previous president's administration, he, his administration 
actually delivered a report about the loss of revenue globally. I don't think it was just US, I think it was globally around um, people not able to work outside during heat stressed times. So thank you, Sue Ellen. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Patrice. Is there an emergency preparedness checklist that one can refer to online to help them better prepare for you know, anything that's to happen? You talked about medications and water. I I'm sure there are other examples too. I think there are a lot. And I think um, I should have done this before, but I think like Massachusetts has one and I'm just gonna Google it right now. And while you Google Swellen, Amy, that is a great question from the audience because uh, there's a checklist for surgical services where surgeons make sure they do this, that, and the other. There's a checklist for airline pilots. And having a checklist is a really fantastic idea. Sorry about my phone in the background. Massachusetts does stay one and have stay one have one and I'm going to put it in the chat. Thank you. Um, and if you if you don't get it, like if you Google, um, I bet mass.gov is another good resource. Yep, that's what this is from okay. actually. <laughs> Thank you. How can family members or neighbors help others at higher risk for health consequences of climate change, particularly for older adults? I think check in, you know, if you know you have a neighbor who lives alone, who's older, particularly if they're socially isolated without a lot of, you know, people who are coming and going, if you have a neighbor living with a disability, um, I, I think that's where the social capital Who's in, and I guess, I guess, like just not being afraid to do that. I mean, I don't have that situation in my neighborhood, but um, although some people might might think I'm the older adult in the neighborhood, but um, <laughs> I think um, it, it, because again, these are the people who would not be able to, you know, not easily mobile if they mm -hmm. have to leave in an emergency. And, um, and so, well, and I'll just add your, to your wise words. Um, when a hurricane struck in Florida, there was a hospital across the street from an elder home care a rehabilitation center. And there were numerous patients being brought over to the emergency department. And it took a nurse to go across the street to investigate why are all these patients coming over, some of whom unfortunately were deceased and some of whom the hospital was able to help recover. And that's an example of whether it's neighbor to neighbor, as Suellen stated, or being vigilant about areas and institutions that are vulnerable. Thank you. So and we, we saw that in Katrina too. Mm -hmm. yeah. You provided some great examples locally. For instance, um, you talked about Charlestown and Chelsea. Where can we go to learn more about how people within our communities are impacted by climate change health consequences? For instance, is there a central resource that provides these reports and summaries? Well, one thing you could do is go to your town website. Um, they, I know my town has information about what they're doing in terms of that. There is like environmental tracking data through the CDC, but that's more on health outcomes. And it's more, um, it's, it's at the, what's the word I'm looking for, county level. Um, so those are two areas. You might you might be able to find something through the Massachusetts Department of Health, but I think probably the best thing to do is start with your, you know, your local town hall and their 
community page. Mm -hmm. And I just typed in the city of Boston um, climate action page as well, and, which is very, very informative. Thank you so much. So I think that's all the time that we have for questions. Before we end today's session, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? Thank you for coming. Um, you know, again, I, it's, it's not an exhaustive list, um, but I, I hope it gives people the sense that this is a pretty pervasive issue that can impact, you know, all of us, you know, and, and not, it really spans the social determinants, but it's not something we should take lightly because it could happen in our community and it could happen in a very unexpected way. Absolutely. And I'll, and I'll just end with a quote and special thanks to Mr. Maxwell and Ms. Eleanor Blum for having us join the, the series of um, presentations. Benjamin Franklin said, when the well is dry, we know the worth of water. And that is uh, a, obviously an incredibly important quote for how we move forward in a climate changing world. So true. Thank you so much, everyone. Hopefully you found today's session helpful. As I had mentioned, today's session is being recorded. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely rest Thank of the you, day. Thank you, Amy.